I'm just getting more and more people that want to disprove the ketogenic diet and shit. Well, today's video is sponsored by Andre, who submitted a generous donation via scottthetruckdriver.com's tip jar and sent me an email um, through the contact me section of scottthetruckdriver.com. Um, and he asked me, that, well, I'm going to read the email, and, and then we're going to talk about this this scientific research back and forth that is ongoing um, in the realm of the ketogenic diet in particular and is generally as a plant-based diet versus, you know, standard American diet versus keto versus animals, you know, which this is not that kind of video. This is not the, you know, fighting with the vegans today. This is pointing out some of the things I look for when I'm doing my research and reading studies and reading the articles that are in these peer-reviewed publications um, that you come across, and some of them are good, some of them are bad, some of them are flawed, some of them involve massive amounts of fucking cherry-picking. You know, it, and, and it's... If you're going to delve this deeply into research and not let people do it for you, which is what most people do. Most people, you know, they find somebody that encourages them that some people do this with me. They're, you know, that I've gone out, I've done this kind of research, not as extensively as like a PhD or a doctor may have, you know, because I'm not, I'm not a fucking expert. These are all things I go out to find or that people like uh, Andre here you know, suggest to me to take a look at, give my opinion and thoughts on based of what I see. I do not get a study, a, especially if it's a lone study or an opinion article that is citing other studies. I, I don't look at one of those as the, yeah, you should fucking be keto or no keto's bullshit or, you know, the vegan ways to go or, the, you know, eat high carb, low fat. You know, I don't look at one source of information. I should stress that. And to be quite honest with you, the articles and studies that you will sometimes find don't get a lot of references. And you got to keep in mind, especially if it's an article and not a study, what are the things they are referencing? What are their financial interests in proving their point? And um, there's a significance in this video that we'll talk about a little bit. Um, and, you know, wh who is this study for? Who is it benefiting? Um, are Some studies are targeted towards something completely different, but provide you with valuable information for whatever your goals may be, whether it be addressing type 2 diabetes, whether it be addressing obesity and insulin resistance, whether it be addressing fatty liver, so on and so forth. Um, so I'm gonna, I've got some strong opinions on the things that Andre has brought to my attention today. And I have some counter studies to, to back them up. The links to everything I'm talking about today will be in the description. I encourage you, and I'll go over this a little bit as we go, to dig deeper through this literature. Because maybe I missed something. I'm not perfect. But these are the things that I'm looking at 
when I look at a study, and I'm not going to read the entire studies to you or anything like that. I've already read most of these studies, sometimes more than once, because, you know, I'm not a big scientific motherfucker. Sometimes I need to digest some shit more than once, and I recommend you do the same. You know, if you have trouble understanding something or having trouble grasping a concept or you really aren't sure about something, you should constantly, you know, come back tomorrow, reread it again, reread it while you're taking a shit, reread it while you're soaking in the magnesium bath in the tub to fucking replenish your magnesium. You know, any option, you know, to where you got some spare time instead of flicking Facebook around, you can flick one of these studies and read and try and understand. And if there's something in the study you don't understand, go look up what it is. You know, the, the research is not a hard thing to do. You know, Google has empowered everyone with the ability to do this. All you need is the patience, the time, and the ability to sort out the bullshit from the real science, from the real proof. So I'm going to give you some of my thought processes on how I arrived at the ketogenic diet being my default diet going forward. Um, the pitfalls of the ketogenic diet will be addressed in this as well. And, you know, I'm going to do the best I can to answer Andre's email. And we will... See what we come up with with this video. This is going to be a long video. Watch it in chunks, whatever. I might let this one digest a few days while I address some of the other backlog of work that I'm doing. I'm also, I've changed up my filming a little bit today. Um, I'm using the old camera again with a green screen because I haven't really done that yet. See how it comes out. I'm also using my screen capture to fill in with some content that I will be addressing. So first things fucking first in shit. So here is the email. Dear Scott, I have discovered your channel by a random search on YouTube. Believe it or not, your name search on YouTube, which is which by the way is my only means of meaningful information like yours, is getting more and more of my attention, along with those of Eric Bird, Robert Lustig, Nina Teicholz, Jason Fung, Gary Tobbs, and so on. You know them all. Well I do, and I never thought I would make a name list with those names. Those guys and gals are all legendary in this research, in this science, in this uncovering of the dietary fucked up lie we've been living for the past 40 years. Um, Nina Teicholz is exceptional in, in her work in uh, the kinds of fats that we eat. And, you know, Gary Tobbs, unequaled in the scientific research he's done. He's not even a scientist. These are, those two are journalists. Their job is to find the fucked up shit. So they go far beyond the science and into the politics and all the other shit. Jason Fung, of course, is a doctor treating obese and, and diabetic patients with a fasting approach. Um, he's not a big keto guy. He's more of a fasting guy and a whole foods guy, as far as I can tell. But he does know about you know, the benefits of keto and so on and so forth. Um, but he's mainly approaching fasting as the most realistic form of treatment. And any speech you watch of his, it's all going to come back to fasting. Um, but he's definitely up there. Eric Berg, he's pretty good as a source of information. He's a little bit uh, orthorexic in the things. And by that mean, that's a, a fear of only eat or you only eat optimally. You fear not eating you know, even the slightest bit unhealthy, which I am not. I realize there are keto foods that I eat that are not in the health spectrum, as far as like pork rinds, for example, which is a junk food that I eat on the ke on the ketogenic diet, which has very little nutritional v fucking value whatsoever. It has some calories in it, some salt, you know, and whatever you season it with, and you know, it's a great potato chip replacement, but it has no nutritional value. Um, Dr. Berg is I respect a lot of the things Dr. Berg does as you know the science he presents some of it is a little bit off from the other scientists I follow and the other doctors I followed I mean they're you know not every one of these people has the exact same opinion but what I do for all of these people and a great my list is a little bit longer than that um, well, a lot longer than that of, of people I follow and people I, I regularly check in with to, to kind of see what's going on. Um, and also I'm always watching the conferences, the low carb conferences, the keto conferences and seeing what new things pop up. Um, Robert Lustig, 
he's the anti-sugar whole foods guy. No processed foods, all, you know, you can eat fruit as long as you fucking do it. You know, the fiber solves all the problems. I don't agree entirely with his nutrition advice. He is not a keto supporter per se, but we're all on the same page that processed foods, vegetable oils, and sugar are the biggest problem for our diets today. And any diet which reduces those things is healthier than the standard American diet, which is what fucked us in the first place. So, you know, I am by no means qualified to be in that list of names, and I am flattered you think so, but I am not there yet, all right? I am not nearly as well-read and educated as many of the people on that list. Um, particularly Nina Tykoltz and Gary Tobbs have probably done thousands of times the amount of research into these things that I have, and I do rely on the fact that they've done that quite a bit to save me from doing it. I mean, why reinvent the wheel? Um, I trust them because I have not heard one bad piece of information come out of their fucking mouths. Um, there are things that they advocate that I probably don't abide by necessarily, but I knowingly don't because I'm not optimal health guy. I'm just trying to get where I'm at and be in a better place. I don't want to be strict, and I think being strict is, is a source of failure for a lot of motherfuckers out there. So that's kind of where I'm at. I, I, you know, I don't think I belong in that list. But continuing. I want you to make a video on an article study linked below that caught my attention, and I'm fairly sure this article will stir you up a little bit like it did me. And it did. You you definitely triggered me with this, this article because this article is a clear biased article, and it is doing two things that I hate in the research world, and that's cherry-picking and, sh and trying to do research when you have a conflict of interest both of which are taking place in that article. And that article is, quite honestly, it shouldn't even be published. It, it should be an opinion piece on someone's blog, not in a peer-reviewed journal, which is why I don't take the journal articles as gospel. I take it as a whole with clinical data, with anecdotal data, which there's plenty of on YouTube. You can see before and after results for keto, for all kinds of shit, you know, and we just got to kind of keep that in mind that it's not all gospel. You need multiple data sources from multiple places to get the big picture. You can't take one little look at something over a six-month period and declare it that that's the fucking way it is because there is a lot of data out there if you dig, if you do the digging yourself. Um, you know, there are meta-analyses, but even they don't take into account the clinical and anecdotal data that's out there, which is compelling Patient after patient being treated with a ketogenic diet showing purely positive outcomes with their obesity, with their diabetes, with their high blood pressure, with their heart disease, with all of the biomarkers returning to a normal range. Yeah, they might not have fucking abs. They may, might not be ripped and have, look like you're... Uh, idea of what healthy is, but their quality of life is on point. Their fucking mental acuity is up. They aren't suffering from all of the issues that you suffer on a high carb diet, which is the energy crashes, the hunger, which is a factor that many people dismiss when they make the argument for one diet or another. How fucking hungry are you while you're eating that diet? Do you have to eat six to eight meals a fucking day to not be hungry? Or can you eat one or two meals a day and be fully satisfied, not hungry at all? And... That is your body telling you you did all right, all right? Your body lets you know when it needs shit. And if it's telling you that you're fucking hungry, you got to fucking eat, you know? And we tweak that and play with it with intermittent fasting, and we have definitely normalized our hormones 
as far as hunger and satiety go when eating a ketogenic diet. This does not happen on a high-carb, low-fat diet. You will be fucking hungry all the time and add processed sugar and processed flour and even whole grains, which I've experienced. You know, you eat the healthy whole grains, you'll be fine. No, no, I gained weight nonstop, no upper plateau like with keto. With keto, you stay in a weight range permanently. You you might gain a little bit of weight here and there, but if you're consistently eating the same shit, you will plateau going back up. When I eat carbs, I don't have an upper plateau. I will keep going up until I stop eating fucking carbs. It's really that simple. I've tested it. Believe me, I have done every fucking thing humanly possible to fucking enjoy carbs because carbs are addictive sugar is addictive i have tested it all to try and keep that shit in my diet and every single fucking time i reintroduce carbs and sugar into my diet the weight creep returns and the highest i've gotten since i started my journey was 215 i started at 255 i fasted my way down 50 pounds i hit the wall of hunger and misery i got completely you know plateaued and this was plateau was in the lower 200s not and maybe every once in a while the upper 190s but mainly that low that lower 200 i stayed at that plateau for a while with just intermittent fasting and the standard american diet i realized something had to be done so i started looking towards a diet that satisfies the hunger the hunger was the bitch of the bunch and made it almost unsustainable to even intermittently fast for long periods of time. I've overcome that now. I can do three-day fast. I can do five-day fast. I'm currently on a seven-day fat fast with zero hunger or energy or metabolic issues. I'm sharp as a tack, which comes with a fast. And, you know, it's it's through experimentation and this research that I came to these conclusions that I base my choices off of. And that's really something that everyone watching this should do. Don't just take my word for it. Don't take Dr. Berg's route, you know, read all these motherfuckers, make it your life's mission to study something on the topic that you believe is helped you the most or that you aren't sure about but you want to learn more about before you try it more than one source and you will start to see consistencies throughout those sources of things that work and things that don't work and depending on your ability to sustain the diet your ability to be happy with your lifestyle and how you're eating how often you're eating you know, and you're going to fall off the wagon. You're going to fuck up, especially in the beginning. This is a hard lifestyle to adapt to. Keto takes six weeks before you start feeling good energy again, before you feel no symptoms of keto flu, before you are efficiently able to burn your fat, before you retain a moderate level of glycogen storage because you've depleted it and you slowly rebuild that. You don't fill it up and keep it overflowing like you do with a standard American or a high-carb, low-fat diet. You're constantly running off of that glucose fuel tank. This is allowing you access to the other tank, your fat. And once you're fat adapted and you combine that with intermittent fasting, you have unfettered, uninterrupted access to your fat storage. You are not relying on glycogen for fuel. You are not relying solely on blood sugar to survive. As blood sugar drops, ketones fill in that gap, and you don't skip a beat. You don't get hungry, you don't get lightheaded, you don't lose energy, you don't need a nap, you know, you don't get irritable. And once you're in this fat-adapted state, it, it you know, it, you can't really explain it to somebody because they don't buy it you, you, until they experience it for themselves. And some of the keto success stories I've seen who, who learned about this shit started out with me and they experienced it finally firsthand for themselves after four or five weeks. And they're fucking loving it. They don't want to go back. You know, they miss the foods. They still have the cravings for the junk. 
and some occasionally try it and realize they felt like total shit, but and they eventually, you know, get to the they get back on the horse because they remember how great it was, how they felt, and the contrast between how they used to feel and how they feel now. Not to mention the biomarker improvement, the health improvement, the weight improvement, which happens to everyone. Yes, you might not get to your ideal or happy or the weight you feel you is the healthy body fat level, but you will damn sure improve your body weight and body fat percentage to a more healthy, you know, lower risk for chronic disease level. And I'm there. You know, I may not be a ripped bodybuilder who takes his fucking shirt off in every goddamn fucking video he makes, but I know that I'm at lower risk for diabetes. In fact, I would venture to say I'm at no risk of becoming diabetic at this point. I am at lower risk for heart disease. My body fat percentage is in a normal-ish range. I'm at the upper end. Admittedly, I could lose 10 more pounds and, and be happy, you know, where I'm at. I'm technically there. I mean, I'm really getting diminishing returns for the next 10 pounds. You know, it's it, that's when I'm getting close to seeing a lot more ab definition in the midsection than I do now. I You know, I don't see hardly any now, which is normal. Well, if you look around you, not too many people got them fucking six packs flock, flopping out. They're pretty as long as it's fairly flat and you can see your dick, you're, you're pretty much good. You measure around the belly, any you know thing for under 36 inches for me being six foot tall is considered a healthy level of visceral fat. You know, I've really been targeting the fatty liver problem, which I know I had. I've quit drinking, I've quit sugar, you know, fructose is pretty much very small in my diet and by no means able to overwhelm the liver's ability to deal with it at this point. And as I do these fasts, I'm whittling away at the fatty liver problem and also improving my insulin sensitivity in the process. All of this with very little time in the gym, if any at all, I haven't gone to the gym in a long time. Um, I hike a lot. I do, you know, that kind of stuff. I haven't been doing that much over the winter because it's fucking cold. I'm a pussy when it comes to the cold. I don't like the cold. Low carb, high fat have worked for you so far, but you are now in a plateau. I bet you'll keep plateauing on this for a long time, maybe years, maybe forever, unless you make drastic changes. I am, I did plateau for a year, but that plateau did drop. It did drop into the upper 180s. You know, it's it's not a solid plateau. It's declining at a very, very, very slow rate. And I contend if I were to stay faithful to the ketogenic diet long term, we're talking years. We're not talking, oh, I'm going to do six weeks, then go nuts for a fucking few months and then do another six weeks and then blah, 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 which is what I've been doing, by the way. You know, there has been carbs in my life throughout this weight loss period. Um, I do want to get to a more ketogenic centered way of eating as far as very rare will I have a carb up, but I know that there's going to be occasions when I do, you know, and I know how to fix them, but I contend if I stayed strict keto over a long period of time, because you gotta, you gotta remember it took years to fuck ourselves, to fuck ourselves up. It's a slow process. I contend that long term, your set point will lower to a normal level. Normal being, you know, completely subjective. You know, normal for one person is not going to be the same as normal for another person because there are other factors involved. Lifestyle, how active you are. You know, how much energy you burn on a regular basis. Your genetics play a very important role. Your, you know, how much lean mass you're carrying around. Your nutrition profile. How much nutrition are you getting in your diet? There are multiple factors. So that I believe that all of those factor in to set point. And you will notice this. You know, like the first 10 pounds I lost were just cutting down soda. So just a reduction in sugar 
showed a significant weight loss result. So, and that was just one variable. And I wasn't even getting rid of it all the way. I was still eating baked goods and fucking Pop-Tarts and all that other shit. But the fact that I stopped drinking Mountain Dew caused that initial weight loss? And that was just one variable. There are multiple variables in our set points. And the more I tweak and the more I change those variables, the lower that set point becomes. So my set point currently, upper 180s, 188-ish, I would say, is the middle of the weight range. And you will have a weight range because you carry food weight, water weight, you know, variable amounts of fucking weight are carried by you at any given time. But I'd say the middle point right now for me is 188. It used to be 194 was the middle point. And my fucking range was throughout the 190s. Sometimes I'd dip my toe on that 200 again. Not anymore. I haven't seen 200 pounds in a while now. So I would say I've lowered my set point. It took over a year of fucking around to do it, including a period of weight regain that I did on a high-carb diet where I went back up to 215, and that's when I said, oh, fuck. And that was January a year ago that I said, oh, shit, got to get back on the fucking ball. And I got back on the ball, and how did I do it? Keto. Fasting. And that's all we could do. And that was on the road when I was eating unhealthy keto. Lots of vegetable oils and shit were involved in that. We'll get into that in a minute. So I disagree with you on the plateau issue. Um, and we'll get into the studies a little bit, you know, arguing about that going forward. This is going to be a long video, like I said. I don't feel I need to double down on fasting or caloric intake. A lot of the protocols that I've been using would work for weight maintenance. ADF being my favorite protocol with keto, I contend I would plateau and remain in the 180s range long term with maybe a slow every couple of years drop in set point. Um, but I feel that I would maintain my current body weight. Um, which is this morning was 188 pounds um, and falling because I'm in the fat fast. You know, I, I contend that if I stuck with that protocol, that would be my set point and it would stay there and maybe slowly drop over time. I don't believe in continuously doubling down. I don't want to constantly be doing 7, 10, 14, 21 day fasts to try and move the needle because I know there is a metabolism drop that happens over the period between five and seven days, sometimes 72 hours. If you're a standard American diet and you're doing a water fast, you'll get that drop a lot quicker, a lot sooner in metabolism. And when you do that, when you're done with the fast, guess what? A lot of the weight's coming back, except for the physical fat you managed to burn off which will return, it won't return quickly, you will gradually regain that weight. And if you're vigilant, you can keep it down. But the moment that vigilance lapses, you will regain that weight. And that's why doubling down really doesn't work. I'm experimenting on things that could be considered doubling down. This fat fast is definitely got me in a caloric deficit. Um, it's got me full unfettered access to my body fat whenever I'm not burning the slight amount of fat, less than 800 calories a day that I'm eating. I'm obviously switching directly to my fat. My ketone levels reflect that. Um, so I, you know, I do believe there is a set point. I believe it takes a great deal of time and that there's been no studies that span the amount of time required to lower that set point with the exception of um, that study of the guy that did the 382-day water fast. That was a study of one, but it was performed by scientists and doctors who monitored him, and he did not regain all the weight when they did their follow-up a couple of years later. Um, that's the only long-term evidence I've been able to find. There are other long-term studies of keto, however, but they weren't done on obese patients. They were done on patients with epilepsy for other reasons, which 
you should still look at those studies because there are other things they document as a result of long-term ketogenic diet. But at the very least, it says that a ketogenic diet is safe long-term. From now on, I highly doubt the ketogenic diet will help you any further more into losing weight. The other thing that you're forgetting that keto does is hunger. One of the drivers of gaining weight is hunger. And on a low-fat, high-carb diet, you will be hungry. A lot. And you will be hungrier than your energy needs require. You won't have the same level of leptin excess when your insulin is high. You won't know you're carrying tons of calories on your body when you get hungry. You get hungry based largely on blood sugar changes, which if you're eating carbs multiple times a day, your blood sugar is all over the fucking place, especially if you're diabetic or insulin resistant. We can get, we're going to get into that argument in a little bit too, because that's kind of the central point you were trying to make and that that study that, or that article you sent is, is, is talking about is that, oh yeah, keto is good for people who have bad glycemic control and insulin sensitivity and diabetics. But for normal motherfuckers, high fat or high carb, low fat is the way to go, which I patently disagree with. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, You do acknowledge, we both know the ketogenic diet per se is not a weight loss tool, it's just a way to not be hungry and tolerate fasting, which in itself is a weight loss tool, which I pretty much just reiterated, Um, so we agree on that. However, not losing any weight while on the ketogenic diet is extremely common. I would say it's the rule in being metabolically healthy. Also a true statement. A ketogenic diet is not a weight loss tool. A lot of you are doing it for that purpose. And it is not a weight loss tool. It is to normalize your apostat. You will be hungry when you need more energy. You will be full when you don't. And if you are not a physically active person, you won't need to eat very often. You won't be very hungry. You won't need as much food food when you do eat to be satiated as someone who's very physically active and going to the gym and pounding the fuck master and doing all of that shit that is working them out constantly um your hormones on the ketogenic diet work properly which is why it's difficult to gain significant amounts of weight on a ketogenic diet you can fluctuate within a 10 pound range on a ketogenic diet you can have a 10 pound weight gain that cause you to panic but i guarantee you at the upper end of that it stops and you stay there there are two sides to a weight plateau in the ketogenic diet there's a low end and a high end Your range depends on a lot of other factors, activity level, how much you're eating, um, variability in activity level. Like if you're really active one day, you know, you ramp up your metabolism, everything's burning fine, and then you spend four or five days not doing shit, you know, obviously there's going to be a larger window of weight gain and loss in them instances. But overall, if you were to eat keto for four years nonstop, you are not going to get that weight creep even as you age. You are going to hit an upper limit that you will stop gaining weight at. Guaranteed. If you're strict, faithful, keep your carbs under 50 grams net per day, 30 if you're insulin resistant, and you you won't regain the weight. That's the great thing about combining keto with fasting is you use fasting to chop down some weight And then you make it difficult, not impossible, to regain that weight. Your set point's still going to come over time, even after a fast. And you can continuously do fasts to keep that down. That's why fasting is a lifestyle intervention. You must always fast if you're using it as a weight loss tool. Not always as in fast every day of your life, you know, but fasting intermittently throughout the rest of your life is a good way to offset, you know, being below your set point. If you want to keep your weight and physical appearance below what your natural set point is, you have to have an intervention such as fasting. A lot of people use exercise, which tanks your metabolism. 
and keeps it there. And then they don't do the ketogenic diet, which ramps metabolism back up. And, you know, you don't want to be stuck in that negative energy, you know, metabolism to where you're burning 500 less calories per day at rest than you should be for your body weight. And the classic eat less, move more does that flawlessly. You will lower your metabolism. It will stay there. It will not ramp up when you eat. You can try and force yourself to burn more calories, but you will remain floored in being in a negative energy balance, you know, metabolism. And you don't want that. The ketogenic diet puts that at zero. And wherever that zero is for you is where the ketogenic diet is going to keep you long term. And it might not be rail thin. You're going to carry a certain amount of body fat in your life. You have to. It's a survival mechanism. What happens if there's no food tomorrow? What happens if something wipes out all the grocery store's power and, you know, shuts down all the highways? You know, what if one of some massive apocalypse happens? I would say you want to be a pretty fat motherfucker in that situation, wouldn't you? If you are eating a high-carb, low-fat diet, there is no upper end to your weight gain. And the worse your diet is, the worse the quality of those carbs are, the quicker you'll get there. But there is an argument to be made. There are those of us out there who make it well into their 70s and 80s with carbs in their life. They arrive at the same diseases that a lot of us are getting in our 40s, 50s, 30s. Teenagers are getting them. Babies are being born with them now. But you still get there if you have a carb-based diet, a high-carb, low-fat diet. Now, there's different qualities of carbs. There's different qualities of fats. And those are very important in terms of health. Obviously, if you're going to Dunkin' Donuts every fucking day, you're not going to be as healthy as somebody going to Whole Foods every day. And you, you'll you probably be outlived by the motherfucker going to Whole Foods. It's just a fact of life. Dose determines the poison, just like everything else. So yes, you are right. Losing weight on a ketogenic diet is extremely common. It's because it's not a weight loss diet. You normalize, you'll get to your set point your set point might not be in the range you want it in but as far as your body's concerned that's where you belong and on a ketogenic diet is flawless at getting you there because of the appetite working properly being full when you're full being hungry when you're hungry and not overeating when you are eating these are all very significant powerful parts of not gaining weight not gaining weight is as every bit as important as losing weight when you are trying to lose weight what good is losing all the weight if over the course of a year you're going to gain it all back which does not happen on a ketogenic diet followed properly with the proper foods And I had to specify that because there are some bad keto foods and desserts out there that are junk, that will cause you to overeat them, that will defeat that apostat, which keeps your body in a normal fucking range. Getting through the email, um, he, he donated to the channel 50 bucks and, you know, got me all triggered with the, uh, study. So let's bring up the study that he sent me. Um, he sent me an article which linked to this article, like it literally was all it had, but this is the full article. The link will be in the description. Um, and it's basically low fat or low carb for weight loss. Let me zoom in a little here. It's a little hard to read for you guys. Um, low fat or low carb for weight loss. It depends on your glucose metabolism. Now, before I get into some of the things I have a problem with, with this article, um, I want to first draw your attention to one of the first things I look at before I start reading an article so that I kind of know what I'm getting into. First thing you want to do, if there's a disclosure, you need to read that disclosure. That will tell you 
whether or not this is a biased or cherry picking type of article. This is not a study, mind you. This is an article referencing multiple studies um, in doing so in a fairly scientific way. And the press will take this article and run with it. You know, is, you know, basically if you glance at this, you'll say high fat, low carb. Didn't work as good as low fat, high carb in the Chinese people. And if you that's as dig it, bit, if this article is as deep as you get into that, you are being misled. And unfortunately, a lot of the health blogs and the mainstream media health fucking shit that they spew out on a daily basis through daily news shows and whatnot is based off of articles like this because they're peer-reviewed and written and cite studies, but they're not giving you the full fucking picture of what's going on, you know? And at a glance, one could easily say high-fat, low-carb diet, fail, unless you're diabetic. Not the case. I contend that a ketogenic high fat, low carb diet, and that is an important distinction to make, properly formulated with the proper fats, the proper meats, the proper whole foods, is healthy for just about everyone. There, I said it. There's a statement. It's a good thing I'm not a fucking expert. People be all over my ass, especially the vegans. The... You know, the first thing I came across in this study was that this study leans heavily on is this study that was done in China. The effects of macronutrient distribution on weight and related cardio metabolic profile on healthy non-obese, non-obese Chinese, a six month randomized controlled feeding trial. And basically, if we jump down here. And the first thing I wanted to know is what the fuck were they feeding them? Before I delved into any of this shit, I wanted to know what did they feed them. So I scrolled down and I found, first I found the macronutrient breakdown of the study. What are they saying is high fat, low carb? 40% fat, 46% carbohydrate. That is not a ketogenic diet. That is a slightly, that is even at the upper end, I would say, of low carb. As in, you are not working on ketones there. You are a fucking sugar burner on a diet with a macronutrient breakdown like that. And if you are in a sugar burning state and consuming large amounts of fat, you are going to have health problems. Hands down, indisputable. And as if that's not bad enough, if we look down at what they're feeding people, what kind of fat are they giving them? Saturated fat's not a big thing on here. Healthy saturated fat is in short supply. So if I look here, you know... Soybean oil, that is a vegetable oil. That is not good for you. It goes rancid quickly. It causes inflammation to uh, huge amounts. It's used in most processed foods in the standard American diet. In fact, I would contend this high-fat, low-carb diet falls in the realm of the standard American diet as far as the quality of foods. There's a lot of processed foods. I mean, you got bran. You know, yeah, you got eggs in here. But what good's eating eggs when you got sugar and soybean oil and flour as part of your fucking meal? Which comes from the high-fat cookies. Yeah, let's give them cookies. All three groups got cookies, by the way. So there's that. You know, this is not a ketogenic diet. You cannot dismiss keto in insulin resistant people due to this diet and this is one of the centrally you know 
quoted, he showed figures from this and another study that we'll get into. But this is the kind of cherry picking we get into. There's, these are their traditional foods, by the way, that, you know, Chinese people are eating, supposedly. I don't know that for sure. I don't know. I'm not Chinese. I've never been to China. Um, I know that the American version of Chinese food is not the same as the Chinese version of Chinese food. Um, but, you know, this is by far not keto being tested here and should not be misinterpreted just because they use the term high fat, low carb. You know, a lot of people have associated keto with high fat, low carb. You got to keep in mind, there are a lot of studies that don't make that distinction that are used to slam keto. And this study is one of them. So I've already pretty much shot down this study without having to read the whole thing. I still read the whole thing. Um, ultimately, the bottom line is people on the low-fat, high-carb group lost more weight than people on the high-fat, low-carb group. And that is the statement that will be quoted from this article. They'll pull that right the fuck out of it. They'll ignore the types of fats, the macronutrient breakdown, the amount of calories, the physical activity. You know, all of that will be ignored. And that one statement will be cherry-picked and published in blog after blog and article after article saying that, you see, you can eat carbs and shit. This fucking study said they lost more weight. No, they weren't really doing a good comparison. Not to mention, six months, not a long enough period of time to bless a diet or curse a diet. So weighing it alone on a six-month trial, it's bullshit. You know, you can't make decisions based on one study. And keep in mind, there's not a lot of references in this article. Six references. We'll, we'll get into that in a minute. So, and if you look at some of them, you know, it, there's no, like, there's no bias. And I don't even have to look at this, this to realize that there is bias in this particular study. Atkins and other low carbohydrate diets hoax, or an effective tool for weight loss. That's a setup fucking thing. That's like a clickbait fucking title you'd put on a fucking shitty fucking Logan Paul video or something. This is not the kind of fucking study that you put a lot of faith in. You know? And it should also note that in the disclosure, which I t talked about earlier, you know, they're looking... At patenting a product that uses biomarkers for prediction of weight loss responses based on fast, fasting plasma glucose and insulin. In other words, they're looking at products in treating weight loss based on whether or not you're diabetic, whether or not you are, you know, insulin resistant or insulin sensitive. Bottom line, most people are insulin resistant. Look at the obesity rate if you want a good snapshot of how insulin resistant the population is. We've been doing a 40-year low-fat, high-carb fucking experiment with vegetable oils and sugars and processed foods, and look what happened. Just saying. Now, a lot of people are going to be like, oh, it's because of the fat. Our fat consumption has not varied in the United States like it has in China, which is cited in, in these articles. But whenever we introduce our diet to a place with a diet that is not the standard American diet, it destroys their health. You know, Aborigines, there's tribes in Africa that have become more westernized. Every country which has adopted our capitalist-driven food paradigm has become obese, diabetic, heart disease, cancer, uh, and the list goes on and on. Companies are getting rich, people are getting poor from paying the medical costs, and then dying. 
Sounds like a good profit model to me. So that's why I'm highly skeptical when I see these studies and I want to know who funded them, who, who paid for this, who, why are they doing it, what are they trying to prove. Every one of them's trying to prove something. And if they're just trying to confirm what they want, chances are they're only going to see what they want. Now, the other thing that this article did um, is show another result from another study. Um, which basically pitted high glycemic load against low glycemic load diets. Now, you also need to keep in mind that these diets are not ketogenic necessarily. They are high fiber versions of carbs. You're still getting a decent amount of carbs in that. But anyways, it goes into how bad carbs are, obviously. A high glycemic low diet in a pre-diabetic is going to result in unrestricted weight gain. And I contend this line will trend this way the entire time that the diet is not addressed. And obviously, on a lower glycemic load, you'll notice it does drop, but it plateaus. You know, how much more of a drop would they get vary, varying the amount of carbs that they consume? Is this ketogenic? I have no fucking idea. I can't find it anywhere. You know, a low glycemic low diet can be a carbohydrate rich diet if the carbs are high fiber carbs, mainly a plant based diet. Hmm. And normal glycemic individuals, people who do not have, have not been diagnosed with prediabetes, are being fed the same diet, high and low. And you'll notice a small trend upward. And once again, this is in people that aren't there yet, but they'll get there. If you were to follow this, and most of us have, who have aged, have followed this trend eventually you're going to get there. You are going to get there and you will become, instead of being normal glycemic, you will end up up here in the pre-diabetic as a whopping 70% of Americans currently fall in the pre-diabetic range. Yet you might, you might hover as a normal glycemic motherfucker for a while, but this little trend will continue. Until you become this motherfucker up here. That's the problem. Another problem I have with this article. It's it's not showing you the big picture. It's showing you snapshots. Normal glycemic might be fine, but you're not going to stay that way if you're eating that way. If you are eating a high glycemic load diet, you're not going to stay that way. And low glycemic load you're going to stay at your normal weight. So yeah, reducing the amount of carbs you absorb is healthier than not. But ultimately, if you eat a high carb, low fat diet, this is going to be your line over time. Some people will be fortunate and live well into their old age with minimal problems, but they will still hit the wall of diabetes, of heart disease, of stroke, of dementia, of all of the things that kill us. And they just might be fortunate enough to make it to their 70s before it happens. But it will fucking happen. Eventually you'll get a rare unicorn who becomes a centurion, regardless of this. But for the majority of us, this is going to be the majority of us up here. And it already is, if you look at this pre-diabetes statistics. Most of us that are reading this, watching this fucking video, are in this pre-diabetic fucking range here. So, write that shit down. Most of us are pre-diabetic. A lot of people are undiagnosed. But there's proof. <laughs> we are not geared 
towards carbs as our natural food. We're not. We make our own fucking glucose. We are not required to consume carbohydrate to survive. We need micronutrients. We need energy. And the glucose that we need to fuel ourselves, our liver makes. From proteins, from fats. And it does so off of glycerols and amino acids through gluconeogenesis. Look it up. So that's my two main problems with this article. At this point, I would have moved on and not even given this thing the time of day. It is clearly some cherry picking going on, and I, I don't want anything to do with it, to be honest with you. This article, now, before I, I let that go and say that, you know, that article's a piece of shit and so on and so forth, I want to leave you with a study that doesn't have any of those fucking issues. Objective, to determine the effects of 24-week ketogenic diet consisting of 30 grams of carbohydrate, 1 kilogram per body weight of protein, 20% saturated fat, 80% polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fat in obese patients. That's the question we want answered when we're doing this research, is it not? Patients and methods. 83 obese patients, 39 men, 44 women with a body mass index greater than 35. I started out a lot greater than 35. I was up in the 40s. Some of you are in the 50s, 60s, and 70s range for BMI. This seems like a study I want to fucking study. Results. The weight and body mass index of patients decreased significantly. The level of total cholesterol decreased from week 1 to week 24. HDL cholesterol levels significantly increased, whereas LDL cholesterol levels significantly decreased after treatment. The level of triglycerides decreased significantly following 24 weeks of treatment. The level of blood glucose significantly decreased. The changes in levels of urea and creatine were not statistically significant. This study is a badass fucking study. All right? And I don't want to read the whole fucking thing to you. The link's in the description. I encourage you to read read this and read it more than once, especially if you're considering keto and you're not sure yet. The results are clear. You know, huge body weight reduction. It is not a long-term study. You know, 24 weeks. Not a lot. It's about six months. Same as that other China study, only this study is studying the ketogenic diet. I would like to see more of these. I would like to see a legit study of low-fat versus high-fat diets with proper whole foods and proper fats. I'd like to see a breakdown that didn't have any of those confounding fucking vegetable oils that didn't have sugar in them, that didn't have refined carbs in them. I want to see a whole foods challenge, if you would say, between the two in a controlled, longer than six-month study. I'd like to see a year study that pitted, and no one's going to fund that, by the way, that pitted a low-fat, high-carb diet versus a ketogenic diet. And I want to make that distinction of being ketogenic. And I think you'll see a clear and profound difference in most people. Not all. There's, Like I said, there's always unicorns in the population. You know, and not to mention, I read the discussion of, of this particular article, and it goes through everything complete with references. See these little fucking numbers here? Those give you study references. So if you wanted to dig deep, deep into the ketogenic diet and the science that's out there, this is a great launching point study. And the this study was from, I believe, 2004, was it? And this study was in 2004. We've known this. What happened? We get buried. We, we lose track of this. This is a study. Direct study. 
of the ketogenic diet. It goes through. It goes through the breakdown of the vitamins that they were given supplements, you know, because we're afraid of that. I don't think that that was a necessary part of it. But this study explains all of the science behind the ketogenic diet, how it works, the results you get. Um, weight does decrease if you were obese to start with, without a doubt. It does plateau after a long term, without a doubt. You will not regain weight long term. You won't go back up to your starting weight. Once your weight drops that significantly on a ketogenic diet, you will not gain it back on a ketogenic diet. If you go back to carbs, that's a different story. But you won't regain the weight. Not significant amount of weight. 10 pounds max, I'd say. Unless you're eating a lot of keto junk and keto cheesecake and keto all this crap. If you stick to whole foods, simple to prepare foods, you will not regain the weight long term. You'll stay at whatever level your body levels out at within a 10 pound range of. So if you lost 100 pounds going keto, you can expect to keep 90 pounds of that loss long term give or take. And it might drop more over an even longer term. We don't know yet. There's no really long multi-year studies for weight loss. So if you look at the references to this study, you know, someone did their homework. 64 references. I don't see any disclosures. No special interests, as it seems. You know, you could probably dig deeper. I'm sure there's somebody benefiting from this research. But uh, they didn't have to make any disclosures. And that's important. That means this is of benefit to somebody. In fact, it's from a cardiology clinic. Somebody wants to solve heart disease. And they want to know if the ketogenic diet does it. And they're pretty much saying it does. And that it's more effective than some drugs. This is a study I would turn to. Not that other bullshit article or the cherry-picked crap that it cited as a reason that, you know, high-fat Low-carb diets only work in insulin-resistant individuals. I believe ketogenic diets are preventative for everyone. They help you not succumb to those chronic diseases. Doesn't mean you're not going to fucking die from something. But the chances of you dying from heart disease, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, any, you know, stroke, all of those will be greatly reduced by doing a ketogenic diet. Not the biggest issue with keto. And I don't want to end this video without talking about this study here. Long-term effects of a ketogenic... Hold on, let me zoom this shit in. Long-term effects of a ketogenic diet on body composition and bone mineralization in GLUT1 deficiency syndrome. Okay, these are people that have a problem, a disease that I know very little about. But the point I wanted to bring up is that this study was a five-year study. So you want to look at it through the lens of they put these people on keto for five years. The results, a long-term ketogenic diet did not produce appreciable changes in weight and body composition of adults with GLUT5-1 disorder. Um, I don't know what that, or GLUT1 disorder. I'm, I don't know what that disease is. I haven't researched that deeply into it. But this is a very, a statement you can use to say that, yes, keto is not a weight loss diet. But this was done in people who were not necessarily obese. As in five years, they remained and did not gain weight over a period of time at their normal 
fucking body weight. Whatever it was when they went into it, that's what they went, weighed when they came out of it. They found no potential adverse effects of ketogenic diet on bone health. Same can't be said for the vegan diet, by the way, or the high-carb, low-fat diet, which is being blamed for osteoporosis in older women. Um, so there's that. In summary, this case series contributes to a small but growing body of literature that investigated potential long for term effects of the ketogenic diet on bone health. And I'm guessing that disorder has something to do with bone health. So look at further into it if you want, but I mainly wanted to decided that this is the only study I could find that was a multi-year ketogenic study. So there's still more studies that need to be done. That I can agree on. The anecdotal and clinical data supporting the ketogenic diet are compelling enough that we should have randomized, controlled, long-term studies, preferably of inpatient populations who obviously need the help that the ketogenic diet provides. I don't see how you couldn't convince somebody that's dying of heart disease and obesity to give you a year of their life and get paid for it to help further the cause to cure themselves since they won't have to pay the medical costs that are necessarily associated with that. But you know what? If they discover the ketogenic diet and they prove it in a large, randomized, controlled, indisputable study, much like this one, only over a longer period of time, which is like this one, only over a longer period of time with a larger sample size, you know, 83 is kind of small. We could use a 1,000 people there's no money in it you know they can't monetize the ketogenic diet it's eating the way we're supposed to eat it's eating what we're designed to eat nobody buying extra shit you can raise the price of the shit that we're supposed to eat that's about it you know and that's why we won't see these long-term you know smack down fucking diet studies you're just not gonna see them they do not want you to do things that don't help the economy. And a great part of the economy is food and medical. Huge. The economy rises and falls with those. They're basic fucking needs. Everyone needs medical. Everyone needs food. Where better to make your money? So... And that has permeated the research world, you know. So, bottom line, do your research and take multiple sources of information in. There's a lot of anecdotal before and after keto stories that you can follow right here on YouTube. People that lost the weight, kept it off, being keto. Some people being keto for multiple years. I know there's a keto bodybuilder that's been keto for years. Um, and if you add in that data to this study here and to some of the studies referenced by this study down below, and you put all that together, and then you do a little self-experiment, short-term, six-week adaptation, see what happens. I think you'll have everything you need to make the right decisions just to whether or not you like the ketogenic diet. That'd be the only mitigating factor. You know, if you don't like the food, you're not going to fucking eat it. It's that simple. If you're so carb and sugar addicted that you don't see your way out of that, that's where you're going to end up. So I hope I answered your question, Andre. Um... The ketogenic diet, I believe, is going to be my default diet going forward. I am not optimal health. There will be junk keto foods involved. There will be stupid fucking carb ups that will occasionally happen. I have not ruled that out. I have no desire to do so at the current moment in time. Um, pretty much experimenting with fat fasting at the moment and ketogenic diet as my default way of eating and 
I haven't felt the need to have a cheat day since my last cheat day in November. So there's that. Even Christmas I made it through, sticking to keto foods, overate some keto junk food. Gained a little weight that way. That weight felt right back off. Very quickly, by the way. A couple of days, as opposed to three weeks of recovery from a carb up. So, I've practiced this repeatedly. I've done this experiment on myself repeatedly. I've gone back to high carbs, low fat. I've tried to be healthy high carb, whole food based, and low fat. And found the weight creep returns and will continuously creep up the longer I do those diets. You know, I had the whole grain thing going. I'm convinced grains are worthless, part of our diet, that we shouldn't be eating them at all, whole or not, fiber content or no. I do not believe grain, you know, grain's what you feed animals to fatten them up. Guess what? It's also what you feed humans to fatten them up. You know? So I'm not a fan of grains. I'm definitely not a fan of processed foods and sugar, both of which are very detrimental. But the more the do- dose does determine the poison. So the more whole foods you eat, the better off you'll be. If you can't go keto, at the very least, go whole food. You know, stick to fruit as your source of sweet. Don't overdo it on the fruit because you can. If you eat enough bananas, you might as well be eating cake. And Keep in mind, you know, how far do you want to go with your health? You know, how much do you want to gamble? There's a chance you could eat the standard American diet live to your 70s. You're going to be miserable as fuck. You're going to be in a fucking smorgasbord of pills. You're going to be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical costs. But you'll still be alive. That's why I want to be keto. I don't want to be that motherfucker when I'm old. I could very well live to be in my 70s eating standard American diet. I wasn't really doing that bad. I wasn't full-blown diabetic. I hadn't hit 300 pounds. I would have, I think, over time. I'd be a lot more miserable and sick right now had I continued on that path. But I decided I don't want to be that motherfucker who spends what little money he has on pills every fucking week or on healthcare coverage that is overpriced because our population is sick and dying. I don't want to be in that mess. And I choose to make these changes in my life because they feel good. I enjoy the food. I enjoy the energy. I enjoy being a normal body weight. You know, I you know, I'm not trying to be a model or anything. I just want Health. Enough health. Not optimal health, but enough. You know, I tweak and experiment here and there, but ultimately, if I stayed where I'm at today, right here, right now, with a little bit of a belly, and it is a little bit of a belly, you know, 35 inches is not that, 35 and a half this morning is not that bad. It's not great. I can't see abs. I got some loose skin bunching up here and there that I'm a little bit unsightly, not happy with. You know, I'm not bulging, rippling muscles because I don't spend time bodybuilding. But I know I'm healthy. I haven't been sick in a long time. I haven't had to go to the hospital. I haven't had to get on pills. I haven't had to do any of that shit. I haven't even had an allergic reaction in a while. And the more keto I am, the less those reactions happen. My last allergic breakdown was eating a food that was nut-based that had added sugar in it. Lots of carbs in that mix, but still became allergic broke out in hives since becoming more strict with the keto and only having that occasional cheat that i had in november i haven't had any breakout and this is the time of year usually this road salt gets to me or something and i break out in hives i haven't and i'm loving it because hives suck 
They have fucking itch all the time. Wake up in the middle of the night itching and shit. And I owe all of that to this choice, this lifestyle choice. So it's going to take a pretty convincing study with no holes in it to tell me otherwise. Because I myself am experiencing the benefits of this diet. Not We haven't even delved into the mental benefits. They are there. They're even mentioned in that study that I said that is the study we should go by. This, this study. Long-term effects of a ketogenic diet in obese patients. That the mental health aspects of the diet are mentioned and referenced in this diet. In this study. It's very compelling to me. When added in with all of the clinical data that is out there now, with all of the anecdotal testimonials that you find on YouTube, Facebook, keto groups, you know, I'm a member of three or four different ketogenic groups now that I just kind of keep an eye, my finger on the pulse on what new ketos are wanting to know and, and the kinds of things that people are, are experimenting with it within the realm of keto and, you know, and fasting. Fasting is the other portion of it, and I'm experimenting with both extensively because I want to know for myself, I don't want some fucking CNN health blog to tell me how to fucking live if I can figure it out on my own, test it myself, and see that it works for me. And that's what you should do. Figure out what works for you and what doesn't work for you and share that knowledge. That's it. Something works, share it. Something doesn't work, share it. A lot of people have par- a hard time with that sharing their fucking failures. They'll love to fucking come up on Facebook and say, look at me, I lost all this weight. Yay! But you don't see it six months later when they regain the weight. They aren't posting that status, are they? They're not showing you, oh, I fucked up. My bad. Then we're not being honest. We're only seeing half the picture. People want to own their successes, but very few people seem to want to own their failures. And I contend we need to own our failures if we're going to solve a problem. And one of the problems in nutrition politics right now is there are scientists and doctors and fucking food companies that do not want to own their failures. They do not want to acknowledge that they might have fucked up over the past 40 years, leading to one of the worst nutrition, chronic disease epidemics of human history. They don't want to own up to it. So they're, we're going to double down. You know, we're going to double down on the high carb, low fat fucking diet that our ancestors had nothing to do with. We're going to go plant based, even though. Purely vegan diets really didn't arrive here in the United States till the 1970s and became popular in the 80s. Vegetarians been around a while, but you're getting everything you need in a vegetarian diet. You're just not killing as many animals. But we can get into that in another video. I do have a video coming up that addresses that as more and more vegans call me a psychopath for wanting to eat animals. So, I'm sorry for this long ass fucking video plus i fucked up and i didn't do the screen capture in the beginning so i'm gonna have to edit the shit out of this you know do your homework on this keto bottom line conclusion from someone who's not a fucking expert just an asshole doing what you guys could be doing on google conclusion ketogenic diet will balance your apostat will remove hunger from the equation. And think about that. If you're not keto right now, how often are you hungry? How much food does it take to satisfy you when you are hungry? You know, you have to take into account the power of that hormonal-driven system between leptin and ghrelin, between the sensitivity to blood sugar rise and fall, insulin being the storage hormone, being spiked all the time, giving you no access to fat, 
relying on glucose for energy that's stored in a small fuel tank in your liver at eight to 900 calories in your liver and the rest up to 2000 total between the liver and the muscles of uh, in your muscles and that once that runs out you run into hypoglycemia or you hit the wall and have to have more sugar come in because you cannot efficiently switch over to burning fat you'll start burning some fat but you're going to feel like shit you're going to need to stop the activity at some point unless you keep the glucose flowing and if you're not physically active and you're eating like someone who is, you are going to become pre-diabetic, gain shit tons of weight, succumb to heart disease, succumb to cancer, which is being proven in current science to become, be a metabolically driven disease. You know, that whole debate will is for another day. Um, but there is legit science that's come out that is showing the metabolism of cancer and how it may be a metabolically driven disease, which will lump it in there with diabetes, heart disease, and all these other things, which lumps diet to the forefront of how to prevent or reduce your risk of cancer. One last thing I wanted to touch on, vegetable oils. If you are ketogenic and you are eating a lot of soybean oil, canola oil, you know, corn oil, vet these are not foods, all right? And they're everywhere. If you're eating out all the time and being keto, you're getting a lot of fat from those sources and it can be self-defeating. If you're experiencing a huge plateau or you didn't lose very much weight on the ketogenic diet and you're eating, you know, Burger King burgers without the bun, you know, or you're eating out all the time, to where restaurants are giving you pretty little pads of margarine and saying, oh, there's your butter. You know, you are eating too much vegetable oil and that causes inflammation, which can cause weight gain. It can cause you to not lose weight. It can cause further insulin resistance. It can cause further chronic disease problems. Vegetable oil is fucking bad for you. Saturated fats from animal sources, good. Olive oil, good. Good enough. Not great, but good. You know, that, that lets vegans be keto, so we'll, we'll leave that in there. Coconut oil, good. That's it. All the other ones are going to increase your inflammation, increase your problems, increase your issues. And should be avoided. And that is a mistake I've made, you know, on the first couple keto adaptations I did. I ate out a lot. Um, sometimes I had to eat out exclusively because I was on the truck. So you got to keep in mind the vegetable oil thing. And Nina Tykoltz is on the pulse of that. So start watching her talks on YouTube, reading her book, Big Fat Surprise will give you insight into just how non-food this is and why it is so detrimental to our health. And it is in every fucking processed food that you buy in the store. It is There's nuts that are fucking cooked with it. You know, there are, you know, stuff that you think is safe to eat on a ketogenic diet has shit tons of vegetable oil. And that vegetable oil is setting you back. It's not helping. So that's what I wanted to say is my little spiel. But I'm not a fucking expert. I'm just a fucking asshole. But not everybody that puts a fucking article in PubMed is an expert either. And this is clearly, in my book, label is a cherry-picked, biased article trying to support an agenda. Don't, don't buy into it, you know. There's better studies, better science. And this interpretation of a study that really has little to do with the ketogenic diet, you know, it's, it's, it's not something to take seriously, you know. 
you can file this with the other thousands of worthless studies and articles that are published in peer-reviewed papers. This is why you can't use one study to prove a point, because there is a saturation of studies that want to promote a specific result, and if they don't promote that result, you don't even see them. They won't publish them if it doesn't support what they were trying to prove. It's a big problem. Nobody wants to pub publish when they're wrong. You'll never get a scientist says, Oh, my fucking hypothesis completely disproven. Let me go fucking publish my results. I'll be hailed as a success. There's not a whole lot of those. But the moment they prove something's good for you, and it promotes some product that makes that, you know, that they can profit off of to make it good for you, then yeah, you're going to see that all over the peer reviewed fucking studies. It's the same everywhere, you know. That's why you got to, it's one of the problems of research is you're going to come across this shit and it's going to look really good. It's going to be look really scientific. It's going to have graphs and shit and little fucking scientific terms that you can barely understand and all kinds of crap. But when you dig down into the minutia and you find the common sense, Within the, the study, you can see the holes. And when you are citing studies as low-carb diets with a 46% fucking carb ratio, the you know discrepancy being protein, which seems awful low protein to me, you know, you're, you know less than 8% protein, 9%, something like that, seems a little meh, you know, when you're citing a ratio like that and the type of fat you're using is purely soybean oil, that's a pretty big cherry pick right there. And it was a pretty clear misinterpretation of that study in the context that you were trying to put it with the low fat or low carb for weight loss paradigm. So thank you, Andre, um, for this long ass video. Remember, I'm not a fucking expert, I'm just a fucking asshole, and have a nice motherfucking day. Shit.